welcome to the worship service of the First Baptist Church of Marion, Illinois. Located just two blocks west of Tower Square near downtown Marion, this vibrant and energetic church meets weekly for high-energy, Christ-centered services. Enjoy the warm fellowship of the First Baptist family. We pray God's Spirit will be evident in our service and that you will want to come and see what First Baptist of Marion is all about. Father, we come to you rejoicing, Lord, in your house, thanking you, Father, for Jesus, that you would come and take on our form and die for us. Lord God, we, we thank you so much. We bow before you, that you would raise from the dead to give us hope, hope for an eternity with you, hope for absolution of sin, Father God, of forgiveness, of mercy, which triumphs over judgment. Lord, we thank you so much for that. We come together to rejoice in your house today. And we ask, Lord, that you have our way with us, your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> My foes are many, they rise against me, but I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm, my help is on the way, my help is on the way.
those words that you just sang with us and that we just sang, would you stand together? Let's agree together on these truths as well.
sometimes rain But you should see me now Moments filled with tears Lasted all those years Disappeared somehow You never said But blue has never been bluer True has never been truer Honey never tasted so sweet There's a song in the breeze A million voices in praise A rose has never smelled redder The sun Thank you so much, Nicole. You know, if you have made your reservation to go to heaven, um, that is a very 
true testimony in your life. Because if you could see, there's a, another song that's similar to that one that says, if you could see me now walk in the streets of gold, how glorious it is. As a matter of fact, I've told Robin, of course you know Robin, she doesn't always listen to me, but I've told Robin that, uh, you know, that would be one that, a song that I would love to have sung at uh, my funeral. That one would be another one. I love that, the, the words of that song, because heaven is a wonderful place to end up and start your new beginning. Well, I hope you will get your Bibles out. Um, actually, and it's nobody's fault but mine, uh, I am preaching out of 1 Thessalonians 2nd chapter, verses 17 through uh, 20, I think. So that was last week's passage. So uh, we'll, we'll begin with verse uh, number 17 in just a few moments. But I want you to remember, how many of you remember Paul Harvey? How many of you remember him? Most everybody, he didn't die till 1999, had about a 50-year career in broadcasting, which was nearly all of my life. Well, it was all my life, uh, plus. But I remember he wrote something one time that I want to start us off with today. He would come on and say, Hello, Americans, this is Paul Harvey. Stand by for news. And one day he said this, If I were the devil, I would gain control of the most powerful nation in the world. I would delude their minds into thinking that they had come from man's effort instead of God's blessings. I would dupe entire states into relying on gambling for their state revenue. I would make it legal to take the life of unborn babies. I would cheapen human life as much as possible so that the life of animals are valued more than the lives of human beings. I would remove the teachings of God out of the schools where even the mention of his name would be a grounds for a lawsuit. I would get control of the media so that every night I could pollute the mind of every family member for my agenda. I would attack the family, the backbone of any nation. I would compel people to express their most depraved fantasies on canvas and movie screens and then I would call it art. I would convince the people that right and wrong are determined by a few who call themselves authorities and refer to the agenda as politically correct. I would persuade people that the church is irrelevant and out of date and that the Bible is for the naive. I would dull the minds of religious folks and make them believe that prayer is not important and that faithfulness and obedience are optional. If I were the devil, I guess I would leave things pretty much the way they are. Paul Harvey, good day. I want you to listen very carefully to this statement that I'm about to make. The devil's power comes from those who agree with his agenda. Let me say that again for those of you watching on television as well. The devil's power comes from those who agree with his agenda. And unfortunately, his PR, public relation associates, have been very effective in the latter part of my lifetime with control over most news agencies, publishers, social media, movie publishers, educational institutions, and political agendas. His assault on the minds of America has had its effect. Let me just say to you that although we do not worship him, or I don't really want to give him any credit, Satan is alive and well in winning people to his way of thinking in great numbers to hinder the work of spreading the gospel message. But there are those who will never agree with his agenda. I hope a few of you in this audience are, are, are of that uh, uh, thought. There are those who fight the good fight like Paul did to finish the course laid out Uh, sharing the gospel all the way. And we will learn that Satan is trying to hindrance today, but his hindrance will have no effect on our victory in Jesus. So even the apostle Paul dealt with it. So 1 Thessalonians, second chapter, verses 17 through 20. We're going to answer a question today. How does Satan hinder us? And I'm going to ask in advance that you pray for me because the devil doesn't want this message to get preached. I'm, I'm here to tell you. So you pray, and you pray when this goes out uh, across the TV land also that the message goes forth. Here's what 
Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you will bind the enemy today. I pray, Father, that you will speak through your messenger, Lord. Take what is me out and let it all be you, Father. I uh, know that I am crucified with Christ. It is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. So I pray that you will speak through me. You will live your life through me today to be your messenger, your ambassador, to speak your word. Father, I'm humbled by the responsibility and the privilege. So I pray for a spiritual hedge of protection around me, and I pray that you will open the hearts and ears of everyone listening, whether on television or in this place. And I pray, Father, that we will understand that to agree with the devil's agenda is what empowers him. We must, we must as followers of Jesus Christ only agree with your agenda. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to begin uh, by uh, talking with you about how Satan hinders us. Satan hinders us by putting potholes in our paths. By putting potholes in our path. Paul's desire was to be with the Thessalonian church. Paul was separated from the church family in Thessalonica. And he wanted to be with them. He had come in. He had started a church there. There was a whole group of baby Christians there that had just asked Jesus into their heart. And because of the persecution, he was made to leave that place. And he wanted to be with them. He had other people there that was helping them. But he wanted to be there because he loved them. And he wanted them to grow up. He wanted them to go from being just baby Christians to being a mature Christian so that they could spread the gospel. And they were. He wanted to be there. In uh, the message, which is a paraphrase of Scripture, uh, translates 1 Thessalonians 2.17 like this. And this is Paul speaking. Do you have any idea how very homesick we became for you, dear friends? Even though it hadn't been that long and it was, our, it was only our bodies that were separated from you, not our hearts, we tried our very best to get back to you. He wanted to get back to them, but there was a problem. And we see that in verse 18. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time it and again, but Satan hindered us. You know, I read that and think, man, if Satan could hinder Paul, what chance do I have? But we can learn some things from this passage today. Let me just first begin by uh, defining what this word translated in the New King James Version as hindered, what it actually means. Uh, a, a papyrus in the 3rd century B.C. used the verb to mean this, to cut in a road to make a road impassable. It means to put up a roadblock for the purpose of stopping an exhibition. So I I brought this today so that you would understand what I'm talking about. You see, I didn't think it'd be right to put a pothole up here on the stage. You couldn't see it very well. The balcony folks could, but uh, you all couldn't see it. So I want you to think about this, okay? Think of it like this. Satan's goal is to put something in your path that will keep you from making forward progress in the place that God wants you to be. He puts hindrances, blockades. You know, you can kind of think of uh, uh, the old uh, westerns where there was a train going down the track and they got there and there would be logs over the tracks to, to be a blockade or something to block the path to keep the train from going where it wanted to go. This past week, I decided that I was going to do something nice for my wife. I do that occasionally. And uh, I decided that... Uh, it was about time that we had a good old biscuit and gravy from Hardee's. Now, I know it's a, not the best thing probably for me to be eating, but every once in a while, I just got to have me one, and I thought she would enjoy that. I got up before she was awake, so I was going to have it ready for her when she got back. And so I went to, uh, 
to Hardee's, and I'm going through the drive-thru, and I gave the, the drive-thru lady, young lady uh, that was there, I gave her a $20 bill. And so she gave me change back. But when she gave me my change back, she had one dollar that I had closed my hand and she put another dollar on top like that and the wind caught it and blew it. Okay? No. What happened next was, was, was interesting because apparently it caught on the top of my car. Okay? I couldn't see it. But she could see it. And, she, and all of a sudden, I, I'm, stand, I, I'm looking in the window thinking, well, I lost that dollar, you know. I, I, I can't get it back. She takes off all of the hindrances that she had on her body. She took off her headphones. She took off her apron. Something, she had some kind of belt on. She took that off. She came through the drive through window. I know only these things happen to me, but this is absolutely the truth of what happened. I don't know her name, but she came through and she grabbed that dollar. Well, I stuck my, I thought, she's going to kill herself, you know, because there was a little room between us and the, and the drive through window. And so I put my hand across just in case that she fell, I could push her back up and she could get back in the window, you know. And so she gets the dollar and she starts on her way back in and my hand's like that and all of a sudden I look through the drive through window and there's another woman behind the counter looking over giving me the look <laughs> and the look was something like this you didn't just pull her out that window <laughs> no I didn't do it at all but boy it didn't look good so she got that dollar out and she handed it to me and as she got back into the window, just fine, and she walked over and got me off the hook, told the lady, no, 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 I, I got... And so when she came back, usually you don't tip the drive through window people, but I said, look, this dollar is yours. <laughs> For going above and beyond the call of duty. So, so Hardy's drive through lady, hope you're watching today. I salute you. <laughs> But the reason I told you that chapter out of the adventures of Bob is uh, the hindered, the hindrances. She couldn't get through the window. She was a small, petite young lady, and so she could have made it, but she had hindrances on. And let me just say to you that it is Satan's goal. It is his strategy to put hindrances in your life to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. Well, how does he do that? Well, let's talk about that for a moment. Satan's first strategy is to get people to believe that he isn't real. Yeah, but Satan is real. Paul never downplayed the work and activity of Satan. He, in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, will find he described him as a tempter who tempts men. He, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, he calls him the evil one. He calls him the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And in Ephesians 2, 2, he calls him the prince of the power of the air. So what Paul is saying is, is that the devil is alive and well and striving to get you to agree with him. His agenda so that he will be empowered to spread his message across the entire United States and world. That's his goal. You know, when I used to visit farms in the Lick Creek area, I always assumed that they had a dog. When I would go up and, and I, would be, I would come up the gravel road to their house, I would usually honk or, or do something, and I just assumed that a dog was going to come out and uh, try to eat me because I was violating his space. Satan doesn't want you to believe that he's there. He just is in hiding and he wants, you, he wants to have all of his effect on you and he wants to put the bite on you and hurt you bad, but don't fall for the enemy's tricks. Paul certainly didn't. Paul believed the devil was real and has a horrible plan for your life. His, and the more you agree, the more effect his evil has on you and the more he will keep you separated from those that you love and will stand with you to proclaim the gospel message. Satan's second strategy is to get people to agree with his lies and to do his will. 
John Calvin wrote this. He said, whenever the ungodly causes trouble, they are fighting under the banner of Satan and are his instruments for harassing us. You may remember the story. I'm not going to go into all of it, but you remember when Adam and Eve were in the garden and Eve was uh, 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 approached by the serpent. And the serpent said to Eve, basically, that uh, you will not surely die. You will surely not die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He lied to her, basically. He told her a lie. He tried to get her to believe and and agree with his agenda. And when she did that, the fall of man occurred through her husband, Adam, who she also convinced, just like Satan convinced her, she convinced him to participate in the eating of the forbidden fruit. And so here we have a situation that gives us a good example of how Satan works today. He wants you to agree with him. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 9 and 10 says this, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all, get this, unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Everyone has a choice. And as we talked about last week, we choose whether we accept or we reject God's agenda. We were created to choose God, but many don't. And those who don't are choosing Satan's alternative plans. Satan's will is anything but God's will. God has a wonderful plan for your life. He wants to be in fellowship with you all of your life. And then he wants you to live with him in heaven forever. You don't just get to heaven on your own works or in your own power. Without Jesus, you will not go to heaven. I know all of you think, well, I've lived a good life and you know, I'm going to be okay. That's just not the truth. And Satan's been lying to you all your life if you believe that. Well, let me just uh, give you some examples today because there's so many things being said out there that reeks of the devil if you just listen to it. I was watching this past week uh, about uh, things going on in Texas and they were talking about abortion, okay? I, I've, got a, I've got, you know, something that, that really gets me when I see the big signs that people hold up. I always see the signs for those who are in the pro-choice realm says something like this, support women's right to choose. Abortion is called today a woman's right to choose. Here's my question. Why do they never finish that sentence? Choose what? I've never seen a sign come from the opposition say, well, uh, 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 abortion is a woman's right to choose to have her unborn baby killed. I've never seen that. It's always a woman's right to choose. Well, all of us believe in women's rights. But what if I had a sign that said, support men's rights to kill unborn babies? Everybody go, whoa, Bob. That ain't right. You shouldn't say something like that. It's a whole different thing. Well, listen to this. If you ask somebody on the pro-choice side why they never finished the sentence, why they never said it's a woman's right to choose to have her unborn baby killed is because that sounds like the devil. Exactly! You see, I believe something else. I believe in the right of all unborn children to have a mother who would choose to let them live. That's what I believe. That is a right that we all can agree on, except those who want to sacrifice their children to the God, little g God, of convenience. And as I look at that, I go back to the scripture I read to you. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception. Well, we want the freedom to choose. We want, we want pro-choice. We want women's rights. But they never finish the sentence. What are we choosing to do? Satan's dishonoring of God always changes the real choice to a deceptive phrase that falls short of the truth. And you could, we could talk about the gay lifestyle. We could talk about safe sex. 
Uh, I mean, there's just so many things that Satan is using today, and he uses only a partial truth to get everybody on his side, and they've got signs, and they've got all these things, and it's just his unrighteous deception. And he is empowered when we agree with his agenda. His agenda is for us to sacrifice our children. And since 1973, over 56 million babies have not been given the right to live. Satan's third strategy is to keep believers from sharing the gospel and unbelievers from hearing the gospel. If you desire to obey God and do his will in fulfilling the Great Commission, Satan will try to throw up roadblocks and hindrances. Some of you heard me tell this story before, but this was such a, such a great example of what I'm talking about today. Uh, I was at another church and we were visiting this uh, family, but the mother and the older child were the ones listening uh, in the living room. And as I was sharing the gospel, I got to the part that says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raising from the dead, you shall be, and that, at that moment, the phone rang and she had to take it. So she left, and she went, and she and I waited, and, and she was talking on the phone. She came back, and she said, I'm so sorry. I, I had to take that call. But what were you saying? And I said, and I, got, I, I finished the verse, and, and I kept on, and I, I was talking to her, and I said, how would you like right now, you and your son, to pray to receive Christ? And the moment I said, pray to receive Christ, we heard a blood-curdling scream out in the yard, and the two younger kids were out there playing in the fenced-in yard, and one of them fell down or something, scratched their knee, and, 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 and so mom runs out. And so she comes back in, and she got everything under control, and, and she said, you know, maybe this isn't working out for us to talk about this. Maybe I could make an appointment with you to come to your office where we wouldn't have so many distractions. And I said, would you mind telling, would it be okay if I told you what's going on? And she said, what are you talking about? I said, what's happening now is Satan is doing everything he possibly can to keep you from hearing this message. And if you agree with his decision, you may never come back to hear this message again. Because once you agree with his decision, you are never safe. Ever. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, phone rang. The kids are, 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 are going wild. You know, the dog might get out of the fence next. I said, you know, the lights may go out. I don't know what's going to happen. But I'm here to tell you, if you agree to receive Christ right now, it will change your life. Because the devil doesn't want you to be saved. He wants you to wait. And she looked at me and said, I'm going to agree with God. Let's do this. I don't care what happens. Let's just keep going. And she prayed to receive Christ. And her son prayed to receive Christ right then. If you're not a Christian and you're listening to this on TV or out here in this auditorium, trust me, Satan will try to hinder you in receiving Christ today. How can you stop him from hindering you from receiving Christ today? Well, first of all, start in James 4, 7 and 8, and then verse 10. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Down in verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Let me just share with you some lies that the devil, if you're not saved here today, you don't know for certain that when you die, you're going to go to heaven and, and, and because of your profession of faith and receiving Jesus Christ into your life. Here's some of the things that Satan's going to try to tell you. Here's a devil's lie. You don't need God to live a good life. Your way is fine. You're doing okay. You're not a bad person. You're a good person. Yeah, it's okay someday maybe to, to go and, and accept Christ, but, but not today. Well, what's God's answer to that? Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but, in, but its end is the way of death. James 2, 10, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For the wages in Romans six twenty three, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the answer you need to give the devil if he's telling you to wait today. You see, some of you may be hearing, well, is God even real? Who, 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 can, who can really know if God is real? What's God's answer? Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. 
Psalm 119, 1 and 2, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork day unto day utter speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. The devil may be saying to you today, his lies, well, death is the end of man. One of these days we're all going to end up uh, uh, in a casket or, or cremated and, and that's it. We won't know anything else. Well, what does God have to say about that? As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through me. Some of you may be here in this auditorium today. And you may be thinking, Satan is whispering into your ear. Well, you know, the preacher in a little bit is going to give that invitation thing. And he's going to invite people to come and and say that they accepted Christ. But you know, there's too many people in here for you to come. And if you agree with his agenda, and you believe that lie, and you leave this place not doing what God is calling you to do, You will not be safe. You will never be safe believing the devil's agenda or agreeing with his uh, agenda. Matthew 11, 28 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There are not too many people in here. Matter of fact, if you come down this aisle in a few moments and say, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord, I want to join the church, I want to be baptized, then all these folks are going to just be so excited and, and, and patting you on the back and loving you. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be afraid of. Matter of fact, you'll start the the, the angels in heaven having a party. They'll be excited. The Bible says, likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. If you come and turn from your way of living today and turn to God's way of living, the angels are going to start singing a song on your behalf, praising God. This one is particular. This devil's lie is particular sensitive to me because this is the lie that he used on me that I almost bought into the night I was saved. He said to me, it's okay if you get saved, but do it tomorrow night. You can do it later. Wait till tomorrow night. I was in a a youth revival and and it was Friday night and, 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 and there was already... 11 youth had gone forward and prayed to receive Christ. And the devil said, nah, if you go up tonight, everybody's going to think you just did it because all the rest of these kids went up there. Just wait till tomorrow night and they'll know that that you just went up because you wanted to go. Just wait. Just wait. I come that close to buying into that. If I would have agreed with Satan, I wonder what he would have tried to do to me between Friday night and that next night coming in. I praise God that my Uncle Richard came back. to. I was, I, y- y'all remember those little churches that they had those classrooms that had the folding doors in the back? I was sitting in the second row of the classroom. I was so far back in the back, I'm here to tell you that, uh, you know, I was almost hidden. And my uncle came back to where I was and said, Bob, why don't you be saved tonight? And I said... Yeah, I think that's what I want to do. And I went up to the front of the auditorium and I knelt down with one of the deacons, Chuck Miller, and on my knees I prayed to receive Christ into my heart and life and I did not agree with the devil's agenda and God has kept me all these years as a result of that. Go today, agree with his agenda on any level and if you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die, then you accept Jesus right now. Right now. You may be thinking, well, you know, I can just pray where I am. I don't really need to make it public. Well, there is some truth in that. But let me just say to you that God's answer to that is in Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus died on the cross for you. Surely you can walk down and say, I just got saved to a group of people who are just going to love you as a result of it and rejoice with you because of it. It's not like persecution if you walk down here and get saved and ask to join the church and and, and ask to be baptized if you've never been baptized. Folks, 
it's going to be a joyous thing. But it takes faith to make that first step. And just to, to let you know, uh, I talk to the TV audience once in a while, but as soon as I say the final prayer, the invitation is not on television. Okay? So for those of you here, if you come forward, it's just going to be usins. Y'all know what usins are, don't you? Where I come from, that's in the dictionary. I don't know about you, but it's just usins. We would love to have you in our family. Do you know why Satan hates you? Do you know why Satan is working so hard to put hindrances in your life? Satan hates us because of our personal relationships in Christ. Our personal relationship with Christ, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and our relationship with others. The works of Satan can be traced to that hatred. Matthew six nineteen through 21 says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Paul is saying, my treasure is in the relationships that I have in my brothers and sisters in Christ. So like Paul, God is interested in people. The heavens are his. The mountains are the work of his hands. The oceans are his handiwork. But his pride and his pleasure is you, us. He loves us and he died for us. Satan hates that because, folks, there is not going to be any fellowship in hell. Oh, I've heard people say, well, I want to go to hell because that's where all my buddies are. There will be no fellowship in hell. And we have all these movies and stuff about Satan uh, being on a throne in hell and, and, uh, and telling minions to do all this stuff. Folks, when he gets to hell, he's going to suffer just like the rest of you. And the only thing that he's going to have is that he took a whole bunch of people that God loved with him. That's all he's going to have. Don't agree with his agenda. Satan hates you. You see, God is good. All the time and all the time. He loves us. The devil is limited. He's judged. He's condemned. He's in prison. And he's reserved for judgment. And you do not want to follow him anywhere, not on earth and not to hell. Because there's not going to be any fellowship there. There's not going to be people sitting around doing bad stuff. It's just going to be torment. And the absence of God is going to create an atmosphere of fear like nothing you've ever experienced in this life. But you don't have to agree with that agenda. One more dog story. Back to Lick Creek when I would visit uh, the houses. I remember one house that I went to visit. I pulled up down this long gravel lane, and, and uh, I'd never visited there before. And usually I have a deacon with me, and I'd send them out first. Uh, but uh, that day I happened to be alone, and, and, and I, was, uh, I, I, I opened the car or the truck door, and I honked the horn. Nothing. No, no dog came running around, nothing, you know. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go up and knock on the door and see who's home and, and share, invite them to church and see if uh, they would like to pray to receive Christ. You know, I was just out visiting. And so I opened the door. So I walked around and, and you know, got almost to the porch. And a silent dog came running around the side of the house, sneaky, never barked. And you know what? When a dog comes around the corner... And they're not barking. You know what barking is, don't you? Warning, warning. Animal with big teeth coming. Best get out of my yard. Now that's a warning and I can deal with that. Because they still may not bite me if I run. Which I probably would. Okay? But when a dog comes around the corner and he's not barking, he has only one thought in his head. I'm going to eat me some preacher today. <laughs> so he come around the corner... And he got about, and I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm not going to be able to outrun this dog. What am I going to do? I started saying, oh, nice puppy, nice puppy. Didn't, no, didn't phase it. But it got 10 feet from me. And the chain caught. <laughs> Boop, whiplash to that dog. And I'm like, thank you. Well, right before that, I had prayed a very theological prayer. Lord Jesus, help me! He hears those prayers. Y'all know. 
But when that chain caught, and I realized that that dog was bound, I still ran to my truck and closed the door. (laughs) Chains break. But I learned something about that situation. Satan can try to deceive you. Satan can bark at you. Satan can growl at you. And if you agree with his agenda... Now, if I'd walked over there, I could see in the grass how far the dog could go after I got to looking. If I'd been dumb enough to walk over there and say, Nice puppy. It had got me. When you agree with the devil's agenda, you walk over into his territory. And he can sink his teeth into you then. He can bite you. He can attack you. The goal is to stay here. What was Paul's problem? A bunch of people around Paul had decided to agree with the devil's agenda and hindrances were put up. Potholes were put in his way. And the reason that Satan did that was because he hates you. Because God loves you. Listen to what 1 John 4 says. The spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Listen, the devil's power comes from those who agree with his agenda. We don't believe in that agenda around here. And believing in Jesus Christ and believing that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me means that we can commit ourselves to stand and teach our children and young adults that even though Satan may try to hinder us, he will not be allowed to hinder the spread of the gospel because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. How about you today? Right now, will you agree with God's agenda for your life? I don't know what you're into. I don't know what you're doing. And I don't know what God's call on your life. I know some of God's call because it's the same call that I have. The great commission, uh, uh, the great commandments. I mean, those things are here in the word of God. We know that we're supposed to be part of his Uh, uh, God's agenda to seek and save those who are lost because we share our gospel message with the world. That's why we go and knock on doors. That's why we go out and tell people. That's why I preach the gospel message every Sunday morning is so that those who are lost may be found by a God who loves them. And that's how victory in Jesus is, comes about. Listen, today you can agree with God's agenda. You can make it a point to set your agenda by what this book says and you can make your decision today to accept Jesus into your heart and into your life how do you do that? first step admit that you're a sinner and agree with God don't agree with Satan to keep doing it agree with God by asking him to forgive your sins and that you are going to turn from your way of living to God's way of living that's the first step The second step is to believe in Jesus. Believe that Jesus lived on this earth. He died on the cross for your sins. That he was buried and he rose from the dead. And that he is the living son of God. Just tell him, I believe that. And then the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, what that means is that you're going to make him the boss of your life. You are going to let him tell you what to do. When the Bible says repent and be baptized, you're going to be baptized because that's what my Lord, I just confessed, said to do. He's not my Lord if I don't listen to him. I've got to listen to him. If the Bible says to do something, you do it. Because when you agree with the Lord, then you will have the Lord's blessings in your life. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. You may be thinking, well... God's not going to save me. Listen, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from from the dead, God's not going to ruin his reputation on you. He's going to do it because he said he would. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you can have victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning, but then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Let's sing it together. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. 
He sought me, he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory with his redeeming blood. That old, old story is the first step in defeating the devil who tries to hinder you. Let us pray. Father, I pray that this congregation will be uninhibited to do your will today. Father, there's some folks that are thinking about what you said through me today. There's some folks thinking about the lies that the, that the devil is telling. But I pray right now, Father, that you will give everybody in this place, lost or saved, discernment to see the truth and that they will choose the truth and they will deny believing in the agenda of the enemy. Though Satan would try to hinder us from doing what we know we need to do, I pray that today that you will open up this altar and that you will call forth those who need to be saved, those who need to join the church, those that need to be baptized, and that you will call them forth. You said, Father, in your word, come unto me, ye that are weak and heavy laden, and that's my prayer today because I know the end of that verse says and you will give them rest Father I pray for spiritual rest for everybody in this place and that everybody at this moment will say yes to God's agenda and no to the devil's hindrances in Jesus name we pray Amen